Hello, I'm Beverly Lewis with the Florida Bar Center for Professionalism. Welcome to another in our series of historical videos. Today, we're in Jacksonville, Florida. The date is April 30th, 2001, and today I'm with Circuit Judge Susan Harold Black. The building we're in is the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, and Judge Black, thank you so much for giving us the time to sit down with you today and talk about professionalism. It's my pleasure. Let's go back to the beginning of your law career. And maybe it even has its roots before law school. I'd like to hear about how you decided to choose a career in law. At a very young age when I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I, I was about eight years old and I told my father I wanted to be a lawyer. My father was a lawyer but didn't have an active practice. And we were home. We were coming home to Florida, and he'd been in school with the dean at the University of Florida, so he took me by and introduced me to him. And they talked to me, assured that I would change my mind. By this point, I was about 10. And I never changed my mind, and my father never told me I couldn't do it. So I did it. Starting at eight years old, really? It just, uh, one, uh, one time in my life, when I was 15, I, I worked on a project, a science project, having to do with dentistry. And for about 12 months, I thought I might want to be a dentist. Other than that, my whole life, I wanted to be a lawyer. How did you uh, choose your law school? Tell me about those days. Well, it, it's a family joke. My, my father said that it, I would uh, have his full support, and in fact, I had a his full scholarship if I went to the University of Florida College of Law. <laughs> so I had I had one choice, and fortunately, it was my choice. Fortunately, I didn't. I it never occurred to me I would go to any other law school. As I said, this was this was not really a well thought out plan, but it was a lifetime plan. It was very focused. It really was. I wonder about, in those days, was it unusual for a woman to, to have such a clear career choice in mind of, of law? Yes, but I don't think I fully realized that. And nothing came along in my life to, to deter me or uh, to change my mind. There were a, a hundred students in my entering class, and there were two women. And there were five to seven women in the law school, so it, depending on what year. Mm. I quickly learned it was not, I really don't think I understood till I went to class the first time that there would be so few women. With that being the situation, was there anyone who was to you at that time, or even before that time, a, a mentor? After that time. Throughout law school, the other students just treated me, <laughs> it's, it's overused, but like one of the boys, <laughs> and, and, but they really did. And so it, it made law school comfortable for me. Now, there were times that were awkward. There were some professors who really didn't think women should be in law school. At, but it, most of the students were very supportive and just treated me like, one of them. And when I got out, it was through some of my classmates that I had my professional opportunities. Every position I obtained at the beginning or was offered was directly related to someone I had been in school with. Was there anyone at that time who had been a kind of a hero of yours? Anybody in the profession you had looked up to? Or even maybe out of the profession? Not, not in the profession. Later, as I looked back, I realized that my parents were heroes. But at that age, you don't, you don't know it. And then when, after law school, I had people who were, were mentors and who helped me, or I could not have, have done it. I could not have done the things I wanted to do. And every step of the way, there would be someone who, who would be helping me. Who were they? The, uh, some of the state judges, I named some names, Charlie Lucky, John McNatt, Al Gressley, Lamar Weingart. And when I was a young prosecutor, they would take the time to help me. And, and I knew what their fields were of expertise, too. I knew that no one knew civil procedure better than John McNatt. 
Uh, no one had more common sense, uh, had more common sense than Al Gressley. And I knew their, their strengths, and so I would go to them, and they would help me. Roger Waybright. And, and they all helped me. I'm glad I had about five because I don't think one of the, they would have abandoned me. But they, they really did help me. And then when I went on the bench, they continued to. All I had to do was scoot in the door and scoot into their office, and they'd help me. So it's clear those relationships really had a, a, a large part in your development. And it was student-teacher. I didn't know it at the time because they, they kept saying, you know, call me Al, call me Roger. I, 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 did, I couldn't do it. I was having so much trouble with that because they were a generation older. And they, they just helped me, and they, they became my teachers. I think I learned as much from them as, or maybe more than I did in law school. And that continued. In a way, with their influence, uh, y your depth of feeling in the, in the profession has extended beyond the length of your career. You've almost looked back at, at another generation. So you've seen a lot of changes in the time that you've I been have. practicing. I have. Tell me about some of the changes that you've observed. Some obvious ones. The, the courts are much larger. The circuit court, which is the as you know, the Court of General Trial Jurisdiction in the state court system, at that time I think had about 12 judges, probably has close to 30 now. And I may be off on my numbers, it could have more than that. It, the bar was smaller, the bar was more cohesive, more fraternal, and, and that's a product in large part of population. And so the atmosphere fear was, was different. Everyone, everyone knew, every, all of the litigators knew each other. And, and of course that, that helped uh, moderate everyone's behavior. You knew you would see the other person again the next day or the day after. So the size of, of the, the, the cadre of practicing attorneys, just the, the, the scope of the the impact of population, as you say. Mm -hmm. What, what other changes? I I think uh, one you're shielded in part in 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 federal court, be for many reasons. But I think that civility has has changed. I think that the the profession is less civil, but I think society is less civil, and it's just reflecting. So you have increased numbers, and you have the tension that's brought about by a faster and faster paced society. Uh, faxes, emails, everyone trying to respond instantaneously. You can't do that in this. This is a, this is, the law is deliberative. It's, it's, a, it's a process. And we're now trying to adapt it to instantaneous response. So we have all those pressures and it shows. It, it shows in the profession. It, it, those are things that, that seem to be a turn for the worse. It, is there anything about the profession that you think is, has improved or anything that the, the profession as a whole is doing right now? Oh, yes. I, th I think the continuing legal education, professional education, both for judges and for lawyers, I, th I think that's right. The world is moving fast. We've probably always needed it, but we haven't needed it as fast as we need it now. And I think the profession is working very, very hard and is doing a very good job in that, in that area, both lawyers and judges. You spoke early about, uh, early about um, your relationships with these older and more experienced folks. And, and I wonder if it inclines you to, to, to think that mentoring, maybe not in an informal setting either, is a good idea. Do you think a program of mentoring for young attorneys would have merit? Definitely. I, I was fortunate enough to be asked by uh, Chief Justice Berger, at, he was Chief Justice at that time, who had a concept regarding mentoring based on the English ends of court, where lawyers would not go to law school, as you know, they would go to an inn and they would learn from the older lawyers. They would learn how to practice, uh, they would learn the law, they would learn the, the ethics, the conduct. 
And he thought that this could be used in the United States, some form of it. He appointed me to a national committee that looked into that. And eventually, it became the American Ends of Court movement. And I think he saw something we are all seeing now, and that is the need for mentors. Is that, that's the concept, that's the purpose of the end, is to have the older judges and lawyers serving as role models and also someone to call, someone there, to meet informally and to, to share. So I, I th the profession itself is, uh, is acknowledging the need. We've always had it. I just talked about my situation and my, and when I started when I started trying cases, there was always a lawyer who was helping me. You know, you know, how do I do this? How do I get this introduced? What, what have you found is a, is a good way to go about uh, this particular piece of evidence, bringing it in? And there were always lawyers who helped you. Now we have a name for them, it's mentors. <laughs> but, uh, and now because, it just occurred to me, because there's so many people, and because we, it's such a large profession. Maybe we need an organization to help help it because there are practitioners who go out by themselves, and and where everyone is new, and and there's no one around to learn from. And uh, mentoring programs, I think, are excellent. That's part of education too. Well, speaking of education, I, I wonder if you have any recommendations specifically for for law school. Training of attorneys is so important. It's the seminal time. What what do you think might be done differently that would be helpful in law school? In law school itself, the if you had asked me that question twenty years ago or twenty five years ago, I would have said more clinical programs. When I was in law school, I didn't know what a courtroom looked like. We didn't have we had moot court which of course is an appellate process. We had no trial practice. We had no, we, just very little clinical work. And I would have said it would be nice to have a little bit of that before you graduate from law school. I think we might have gone to the other extreme now, where the minute uh, a student enters law school, they want to be uh, picking a jury, they want to be in a courtroom, they want to be making an argument rather than getting the fundamentals, the tools of the practice, which is not as interesting, <laughs> it's, but, it, but it's the foundation. So I, I would go back a little bit to, I think, to fundamentals. I would keep both, the clinical aspect too, but move the pendulum back to the fundamentals. So in your first year, and there are law schools that still do this, your first year you have no choices. You take contracts, real property, torts, so forth, constitutional law, mm -hmm. and then you begin to have your choices. Really, probably not until your third year. I, I would move, move the pendulum a little bit away from clinical. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. What do you see as a, a need in the profession to be per improved, and what do you think can be improved on the whole? Now, you sit, you see so many different types of cases, and so many different styles of presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if any of this has had an Im impact on this question. There's no one style that works. The, the style that works is the style that fits the personality of the litigator. If, and it's hard to force a style I've seen litigators try that. And they, they, they want to emulate a bombastic litigator. And they're a very reserved, studious kind of person. And it just does, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. They want to do it perhaps because they think their clients want them to look that way. But it, it doesn't work. Judges and juries see through that. And so you're best using your own style. And so, so the spectrum. It's like, what, what coursework do you take in preparation for law school? The, my moot court partner was a theoretical math major. It's, there is no set course, just like there's no set style. Regarding the overall 
um, profession, though. Mm -hmm. Is there an area that you en encounter that you think, this needs help, this needs to be improved? Oh, yeah. Professionalism and civility. It's, it's said so much now that I, I even hate to say it. When, when I was originally involved with the ends of court movement, no one was talking about it then. No one was talking about it 15 to 20 years ago. Now everyone is which gives me great hope. Because until you recognize a problem, it, you can't do anything about it. And I think everyone recognizes now that the, to remain a profession and not be a trade, you are going to have to remember what a profession stands for. And a lot of that is helping others. N not in a sense of doing social work, but in a sense of being a professional. And what do you think the differences are between uh, being an ethical attorney and, and a professional attorney? Playing by the rules, treating others with civility, treating your colleagues, treating your clients, treating your adversary with, with a, as your mother would say, good manners. Mm -hmm. And I think with civility, and then the playing by the rules, and not trying to. Now, lawyer's stock in trade, don't get me wrong, is to look at a rule and interpret that rule oftentimes, or ask a judge to interpret the rule to the benefit of their client. So that, that's not what I mean. That, that, that's a lawyer's job. I mean more fundamental rules, the rules of court, the uh, just playing by those, not trying to skirt those. It sounds to me as if these suggestions are coming from someone who has a, a pretty clear idea of, of uh, the compass <laughs> herself. I'm wondering <laughs> What is, what would you call the core values of your life? What is uh, the belief, or the, what are the beliefs on which you have based your conduct as a professional? I, I think those. The, almost sounds like the golden rule, doesn't it? But uh, a form of that, and, and treating um, everyone with respect, and whatever their station in life, uh, even if they are before you and they have committed um, crimes against uh, their neighbor. And, and I, I understand my reputation was uh, of a stiff sentencer, but I do think that I treated everyone with respect, no matter uh, who they were. And, and I think I try to play by the rules understand the rules and play by them. And I expect other people to do that also. And you know what? Usually if you expect them to, they do. Well, if you, if you were absolutely guaranteed in that line of expectation mm -hmm. that your advice would be followed, I, I wonder, this is maybe the imaginative part of the interview, what advice would you give to members of your profession You're tempted at this point and at this age to say, return to the past, where a lawyer's handshake, well, you didn't have to put it down in a, on a, in a contract, where if you told someone that they could have an additional 10 days before you would uh, respond, or whatever you said was, was uh, your word was your bond. But I'm not fool enough to think that everyone was like that. I've heard lawyers my age and older saying we need to return to the past, and that's how they define returning to the past. Uh, I, there were people who cheated in the past. There were people you couldn't trust in the past. There were people who would tell you they would do something and try to skirt around it. Uh, they just didn't last very long because no one would believe them again. Uh, a lawyer's word is their, that's their stock and trade. And if they lie to 
a colleague, if they'd lie to the court, they would see that judge again, and that judge wouldn't believe them. The colleague wouldn't believe them. And so even those who wanted to skirt were disciplined, not by the Bar Association. They were disciplined by their colleagues. They wanted to win. And the way to win was not to skirt. I don't know how you return to that. Because I don't think people have changed. There's something that has changed, though. I mean, there are evil people. There are people who don't, don't play by the rules. There are people who would skirt. That, that hasn't changed. But there's something that has changed. And as I've said before, I think maybe it's population. Maybe it's the uh, forces of society. I don't know. But if I could return, if I could wave a magic wand, I would return to the day where uh, the conduct was professional, if not because that was the way the individual thought it should be, but felt they had to be. They had no choice but to behave in that way. And the, the system would work better. Do you hold out hope that that is possible? You can't return to the past. And you can't change, if I'm correct about what has made the change. You, you can't change that. But yes, I think so. I think the profession has acknowledged the, and, and this is a common theme I, I, from the beginning to the end of what we've talked about, and I just realized that. The profession has acknowledged a need they, to, to stay on top of an ever-changing, rapidly changing legal profession, and they have uh, stepped up to that. They've acknowledged a need to to remember the service component of our profession, and they've stepped up to that. They've acknowledged a, a lack of civility. But I think it's going to be a lot like tough love. To do it, we're going to have to be tough on a generation of lawyers and tough on ourselves. Whether we have the intestinal fortitude to do it, I don't know. It could mean you take a practitioner's license away from them. And that's tough to do to the individual. But that will probably be the only way it will change, is, is to be tough. And uh, that will be hard. It's clear to me you have a great regard for the profession. I do. In that. And we thank you so much. You've given us a great encouragement and a good star to steer by. Thank you very much. Thank Dr. you. Black. I've enjoyed it.